And Corsi, is, it's wonderful to have you here because there's a great tradition of having very eminent biographers here. Last year, as you know, Selena Hastings was here, who's worked on Maum and, uh, and Nancy Mitford and so on. So there is a, this is a nice continuation this year Thank to have you, you here. Um, Anne uh, worked in journalism for a long time um, and then became uh, a biographer, really, and has been quite prolific uh, with biographies. Um, I, I think it's fair to say, I saw you described somewhere as, as a, one of the, uh, the chronicler of British upper class life. You do tend to pick <laughs> posh people as your subjects, by and large, don't you? Um, Lord Snowden, um, Diana Mosley, obviously, uh, Diana, uh, Lady Diana Mitford. Um, uh, so you added to the Mitford sister industry there, which is a rather prolific one in Britain these days. Uh, certainly doing better than our car industry, I think. Um, uh, a biography of the Viceroy's daughters, which is the Curzon girls. Um, and then um, a series of uh, 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 biographies, I think we can call them really, but, but, but around the Debs at War and 1939, the last season, where, where Anne starts to really weave... Uh, weave many stories and many anecdotes of, of, of many of the women of this period, the debutantes who then, of course, had to do war service and so on, um, and the lives and the people that they encountered, the sort of English people that they had never encountered before. Um, and, of course, that, that last debutante season before the war. Um, and also, of course, uh, uh, a life of uh, Edith, Marchioness of Londonderry as well, which uh, is always there. Today, we're talking about her latest book, The Fishing Fleet which again is one of these biographies that's a patchwork quilt of stories and anecdotes about all these people. But I think what we're going to have to do first of all, Anne, is you're going to have to tell everyone, what is the fishing fleet? What is this <laughs> thing, the fishing fleet? Well, the fishing fleet really started in the mid um, 17th century, in the, about the 1640s. Uh, at that time, India was more or less ruled by the East India Company, which had got its charter the last day of 1600. And uh, it was a trading organization. And the journey out to India, the voyage, was absolutely appalling. It took five months. You had to go from tiny little Britain across the Bay of Biscay, round the Cape of Good Hope, and you went in these little cockle shell boats, three or four hundred tons, that bounced about on the waves. Seasickness of a virulence and duration that I hope nobody will ever experience. You took your larder with you about live animals, which their moos and bars and clucks and everything gradually decreased as you ate them. You often ran short of water because you couldn't go into the coast because of pirates. So I can only ask you to imagine the squalor, the stench, the discomfort, the effluvia from the animals floating backwards, the unwashed bodies and unwashed clothes. So unsurprisingly, the people in the East India Company uh, didn't come back that often. They came back probably once during the course of their service. So the next question is, what did they do for women? Well, the obvious answer was there were a lot of liaison with Indian women. These were slightly frowned on. Marriage was perfectly acceptable. And a lot of the senior officers married aristocratic Indian women. And some of the East India Company became so taken with Indian women, uh, they preferred them to English women. There was one who loved all things Indian so much that he became known as Hindu Stuart. And he particularly admired the graceful Indian girls going and bathing in the river. And he described their saris clinging to their wet forms as they emerged. It was a kind of early Miss Wet Sari contest. <laughs> and other men preferred the lighter skinned women from the north. And some, and remember this is the days of no anaesthetic, some even had themselves circumcised to appeal to these girls, and you can't really get a greater compliment than that. Beats a bunch of flowers any day. <laughs> and <laughs> but there were still some who preferred British brides. And for them, the East India Company began the practice of sending out small batches of young women, uh, about 40. Usually they were orphans or very poor. They were all volunteers who were prepared to face the hazards of the journey with the certainty of a husband afterwards, which was necessary. And because they were going out looking for a husband, they were known as the fishing fleet. And the company would feed and maintain them for a year. And if at the end of that year, they hadn't found a husband, they were too nasty or plain or whatever, for even the most desperate company man, they were sent back under the title returned empties. 
<laughs> That's it, very cruel, isn't it? It's That's very, very cruel, cruel, but <laughs> it was a less kind age, I think. So, so in the start, the, this, this fishing fleet was almost organised. You applied to join it and, and, and you went out there. But, but of course, you, your, your book then spans this much wider period. I mean, I, I had known about this, but I hadn't known that this then went on right up until the end of the Raj, right through the, the 20s, 30s, Second World War. Absolutely, and so absolutely. Well, by the sort of 1840s, uh, India had actually become known as a marriage market. There's a quite a well-known poem by Thomas Hood, you can easily find it on Google, uh, which is called, I'm going to Bombay. And the last line is, with a marriage license in my chest. And <laughs> by this time, the East India Company had realized they were onto a good thing and they had started charging girls to go out. Then we get the Raj in 1858. By this time, there was a sort of the apartheid system had set in place, and so British brides were really badly wanted. Uh, I mean, can, we, can we talk a little bit about um, um, some of these women? Yes. I mean, there they are, I mean, uh, mostly English. I mean, there are some Australians, which we'll mention later, but uh, there they are, they're mostly British. They, they get on a boat. Um, and they sail off, and it gets a little bit easier after Suez opens yes. in 1869 and so on, but, but it's still a long voyage. You're a yes. long way from home. Um, and you arrive in India. I mean, in, in your book, you weave in so many different people and the different experiences that they had at difficult time, different times. I mean, can you talk a little bit about what it was like for these girls when the ship docked at, at you know, Bombay or Calcutta and they got off? What sort of impressions did they have? It, and, and the marriage situation, the, the marriage hunt for a husband starts straight away. Right? Yes. In the early days, the girls would get off. Presumably, they would give them a day or so to wash and brush up. And then some leading hostess in Calcutta or Bombay or wherever they landed would give a reception. It was known as sitting up. This was at the beginning. And all the eligible bachelors from miles round would zoom down and sit on the other side of the table and assess which one they wanted to go for. It was an early form of speed dating. And they would have to be pretty smart about going for the girl, paying their addresses, it was called, to the girl of their choice, because otherwise their friend might cut across their bows and snatch the prize. And the girls were pretty certain of finding a husband. In fact, the demand for brides was so much that in those days, if a husband had been felled by one of India's many lethal diseases, there were cases of the grieving widow as she emerged from the church being accosted on the church steps and proposed to by someone. Um, but later on, the pressure for marriage, which I think is an important point for the reasons that they went out, became even greater. In Victorian times, you were really nothing without a husband. The whole of Victorian society was predicated on marriage, and you were almost a non-person. You see, you couldn't support yourself. You weren't educated. You didn't know what to do. Um, you probably became a governess, and there were thousands and thousands of governesses and thousands of novels deploring the plight. Uh, plight. No pension, no nothing, despised by both the people they worked for and the servants who worked for those people. Added to which, between 1851 and 1861, there was a huge demographic shift. The number of unmarried women under the age of 35 doubled in those 10 years, and they were almost all of the servant-keeping classes who could not support themselves. And newspapers, people, papers like the Times, responsible papers, were full of articles about the problem of surplus surplus women. What, where do they go? What do you do with them? Societies were formed. And as I think you mentioned earlier, s s quite a lot came out to the colonies. But these had to be women who could, uh, could be really help me, who could cook, who could sew, who could perhaps chop wood, which the more gently born couldn't. So India was the obvious focus where whoever you were, you had servants. And if you had a sufficient of an adventurous spirit and a contact, you had to have a contact, you had to be asked to, if you had a brother out there to say, come and stay. And people, if they could, would send their daughters out there, possibly in the knowledge they would never see them again. But there was that holy grail of every Victorian miss a husband. By the 20th century, 
uh, the, it got rather different. There were, the fishing fleet was more or less in three strands. By this time, quite a number of families had been there, lived in India for generations, and they would send their children home to be educated, so there was the returning schoolgirl. Then there were the ones who were asked out, perhaps they had a sister or cousin married to an officer in a regiment somewhere, who'd said, come and stay in the cold weather for six months, you'll have a marvellous time. And they would go out. And then there were the ones who were actually sent out by their parents. I met two or three people who said my mother was sent out with the words, go and find yourself a husband. They managed to wangle an invitation somewhere, but that was their purpose. And this is what happened in the 20th century. But we have to remember that until World War II, getting married and having children was basically what women did. You didn't have careers like you have now. Um, marriage was always really at the back of every woman's mind, and India was the perfect setting for it. And, and, and the men that they would find when they get when they got there. I mean, obviously, any any man is better than no man if you go to <laughs> marriage. But you know. What, who, were, who was it that they were marrying? I mean, it, you know, I mean, it's a mix of soldiers and civil servants and traders. Not yeah. No, I mean, they would be met meeting. The real prize were the men in the Indian civil service to get into the Indian civil service, which was founded when the Raj was founded. And it was the most difficult exam in England, far higher than the home civil service. It was absolutely the creme de la creme, the Indian civil service. They weren't allowed to marry until they were 30. They had a very hard apprenticeship. But when they did marry, if uh, an ICS man was killed or anything, his widow went on getting the same salary. They were known as 300 a year men, dead or alive. Um, and they were the real prize. If he became a commissioner, he was usually wound up as Sir Somebody and she was Lady Somebody. Uh, and it was a good life then, a really good life. The other uh, people who married quite often were, uh, were people in the army. Again, you had to reach the rank of about captain before you could. And even the merchants, the traders, most young men were not allowed to marry till they had really served their apprenticeship. And planters, of course, it was di different. It was up to them whether they could afford it or not. So those were the people they met and married on the whole. The, the, the fascinating thing in the book as you weave all the stories together as well is just the, the, the variety of experiences of these girls that turned up. Some end up in Calcutta, Bombay or where, wherever uh, and they enter a sort of a, a, a very advanced social circuit that yes. involves just calling on people all the time and dances and, and everything else. Others found themselves you know, whisked off to very isolated plantations, yes. very obscure, remote dust bowl <laughs> parts of, of, of the country. You know, some coped better than others, didn't they? Absolutely. Some coped much better than others. Um, you coped much better if you had sort of inner resources, if you were somebody perhaps who loved nature. Uh, India's bird population is unparalleled. There's the most wonderful bird life. And if you were interested in that, uh, there's one rapturous uh, reminiscence from a woman who married a forestry officer, they lived a very, very isolated life, but she adored the camping in the jungle. Admittedly, the servants put up the tents and cooked the meals, but it was a marvellous experience. <laughs> Glamping. Glamping, exactly. It, yeah. Glamorous yes. camping. Glamping. Yes, yes. But the Raj, you see, when you first arrived out there, you were probably in some um, fairly large centre because you wouldn't be asked to stay by somebody who lived in a jungle camp, he would be asked somebody who lived in a cantonment, which probably meant her husband's regiment and another regiment. So there would be a ready-made social circle there. Or you would be asked to stay like one of the Australian fishing fleet girls. She was asked by her aunt and uncle to come to Madras. And it was extraordinarily social, the races, the dances. Mm. I mean, above all, um, it was hugely romantic. If you imagine you're a 19-year-old girl from some remote village, perhaps, you know, and you go out there and you're suddenly surrounded by all this. You don't have to uh, raise a finger. There are moonlight picnics. There's paper chases. There's polo matches. There's a lot of people your own age. You get dancing at the club. It's a wonderful jasmine-scented evening. You're walking on the grass. You're surrounded by 
rather attractive young men because they were all very fit. There was a huge emphasis on sport in the Raj. The senior officers thought it was the most marvelous substitute for war. Um, and the younger ones thought it was the best possible sublimation for sex. But as we all know, there's nothing like the real thing. And therefore, when these dances happened, there you were in a pretty evening dress and all these attentive young men, there was an awful lot of what in the film world is called erst. Now, I must ask you to remember this phrase because you never know when it'll come in useful. U-R-S-T, and it stands for unresolved sexual tension. And so there were frequent engagements and marriages. So I, the, um, the other thing, of course, is that, um, which is fascinating again, is that wherever the British go, they never forget to pack their class system and take it with them, do they? Right? So, um, you know, the, the, there, were, there were these incredible, you know, this rigid social hierarchy. You know, you couldn't call on someone until you'd left your car. That's Even in the yes. remotest places, dressing yes. for dinner, that yes. the rigidities of, of English life transplanted to these it was places. Not so much packing the class system as packing the protocol system, mm. because there was this thing called the warrant of precedence, and I think there were 93 grades. It listed everybody from the viceroy right down to the assistant deputy opium collector. And it was partly to help the people like the viceroy or the governor. When they had a dinner party, they knew exactly where to seat people in order of precedence. And of course, wives took the precedence of their husbands. There was one occasion when um, somebody fairly low down, I think a captain or a major, happened to marry a girl who was the daughter of an earl. Well, should her rank raise him up or would she have to come down to his level? The matter went all the way up to government before it was decided. Uh, that, that, that's quite amazing. And dressing for dinner. Yes, Even yes. in the most remote plantations, people felt that, that you was had, partly, this is how you did This is what you did. But it was also, you got out of your very hot, filthy, dirty working clothes. Mm. You didn't want to, once your work was over, you did have a bath and change and the clothes were taken away by somebody and washed. Mm. That It was... A little bit that as well. Yes, I know when men went to the dances, they would take multiple collars with them. That's so right. They could keep exactly. changing their collars. Yes, yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. yes. Um, now, I personally could, could live without sport. I know that's a sin to say <laughs> that in Australia, but I could live without sport. Um, but there is one thing that interested me I would like as a day out, which is tiger shooting. Tiger. Now, this ritual of tiger shooting. Can you tell us about that? Yes. Tiger shooting was a rite of passage for every Englishman. And the number of tigers shot was enormous. Of course, there was an enormous number of tigers. And tigers were seen sometimes walking openly down the road in Bengal. Some of them were man-eaters. And so the supply, everybody thought, was limitless. In the British areas, it was very well organized in that you got a license to shoot perhaps one. You didn't, it, there was nothing indiscriminate about it. If you shot too many tigers, the deer and the pig would, would go to, uproot the villagers' crops and eat them. But if you shot too few, the tigers would go hungry, hungry and probably attack the villagers' cattle, so it had to be very carefully balanced. But there was no such constraint upon the Maharajas, who were autonomous in their own states. And it was on the Maharajas that the government lent when they wanted to produce a really good shoot for somebody important. And viceroys used to go to the larger Maharajas for tiger shoots. And it was important the Viceroy got a good tiger. So there were special measuring tapes made, not with the knowledge of the Viceroy, I have to say, that said five foot and measured four foot six. So you always knew you had a good tiger. And I'm going to make a slight digression because there's a wonderful story about Curzon, um, who shot five tigers. He goes home after being Viceroy. His wife has just died, but a few years later, he goes to the theater to see a play called Three Weeks. It's based on the novel by Eleanor Glynn called Three Weeks, which is all about a beautiful woman who seduces a young man. She lies writhing and purring on the tiger skin and he can't resist it. And it caused a great scandal. So they couldn't get anybody to play the part of the lady, as she's called, on the stage at first. So Eleanor stepped in and Curzon goes to the theater 
he sees this beautiful woman. She was very lovely, and she had long red hair. And Curzon was an absolute sucker for red hair. All the locks of hair found in his bureau drawer after he died, tied with blue ribbon, were different shades of red. And You've got to remember to burn those when you're on the way out. So <laughs> otherwise, someone like you will come along and reveal all my... Oh, anyway, he sees Eleanor, and he thinks the sort of Edwardian version of wow. He goes home, he thinks... What shall I send her to her dressing room? Hothouse peaches to banal. So he then thinks, I will send her one of my tiger skins, because he had five, so he sends her a tiger skin. What he doesn't know is that Lord Milner is also watching, and Lord Milner is also smitten by Eleanor, and Lord Milner has also been to India. Lord Milner has also shot tigers. Lord Milner also thinks, what shall I send Eleanor? I know, a tiger skin. So Eleanor gets two tiger skins, neither of them, so to speak, score. But what it does do is it gives rise to a rhyme that some of you may have heard, but I hope not. Would you like to sin with Eleanor Glynn on a tiger skin, or would you prefer to err with her on some other fur? <laughs> Well, that, that's, that's kicked off the poetry element of the <laughs> Literary Festival here. Um, we have, we've, we've been talking about, you know, tiger shoots and, and dances and picnics and things, but it was, a, it was an incredibly tough life for this, these women as well, wasn't it? I mean, you know, very high rates of child... I mean, of course, once you get married, you start having children. Very high rates of infant mortality, disease. You know, just staying alive was a struggle, even, yes. even for ones in privilege surroundings. Yes, it... Once they married, the sort of the glamorous bit, you possibly met your uh, future husband, your fiancé, at one of these weeks at the station where everything was parties and, you know, people in their best uniforms, looking good. But you might easily have met um, a man who lived on a remote plantation. As one of the stories uh, in my book tells, there was this young woman, she was only 19, and she saw this frightfully attractive man at a bar. She couldn't talk to him because she wasn't introduced. And she saw him several times. They looked at each other, but they couldn't do anything. They hadn't been introduced. As I said, protocol was rigid. And eventually she was placed next to him at a dinner party, and that started it off. And he was running a remote tea plantation in the Animalese Hills, which was very lonely. And as things warmed up, and they thought they might get married. He was a very honourable man. He thought, I have got to show Sheila, I've got to show her what conditions are like. So he asked her to stay or at the very worst time of year when uh, the rain was bucketing down, the place was completely lonely. Uh, her mother came too, of course. It was the days of chaperones. And, do you know, it was really pretty awful. He pointed out that the nearest... Um, possible neighbour, white woman to talk to was five miles away and she would have to ride there or walk there. You know, do you still want to? Um, she said, I did have a little wobble, but she adored him. She married him. And for a long time, she was incredibly lonely. They would have a holiday every year um, going to Utakamand or somewhere like that where they would be social. But it was very lonely indeed. And as you said, Paul, there are other cases. I remember one planter whose daughter I wrote about. He had three daughters. Well, that was because three little boys had died before the age of two. India is spattered with tiny gravestones. Mm. There's, there's all that. And there was the wrench of sending your children home to be educated. The, the downside, you know, and this is apart from the diseases, because... This was all in the time, as I said before, no anaesthetic, no antibiotics, no factor 50. I mean, things were difficult. Mm. I, mean, I mean, you have one woman whose story is quite incredible. She, she goes to uh, one of the sort of, you know, a, a, a remote part of the country to a, uh, a what I think, can cantonment, canton cantonment. Cantonment. Outside of, where the, the British have built outside of the Indian village, sort of upwind of it and everything, you know, and, and they've tried to sort of improve it with a bit of guttering. But we're still talking about somewhere that's stifling hot, extremely dr dry. There's no, there's no plumbing. There's no, no, no. not even fans half of the time, you know. Mm. And, and this, this girl 
ends up there. And, and it's incredibly harsh environment. That it's she's incredibly into. harsh. It's oh. incredibly harsh. And I mean, things like that, you had to be wary of all sorts of things. You had to shake your slippers out in case there were scorpions in mm. them. When you went into the bar, there was practically no ever running water. Um, no flush loos, no uh, telephones. There was nothing. And I mean, if you married a forestry officer, and you lived somewhere remote in the jungle, and just supposing you got toothache, you were perhaps 100 miles from the nearest dentist, the nearest town, and that very few uh, dental problems are solved with just one visit. You probably have to um, stay in an hotel for two or three nights. Well, to get there, the fare by the, from the nearest uh, railway station, which you also had to reach, the fare there, the cost of the hotel, the cost of the treatment, and the fare back, might easily eat up your husband's monthly wage. So, you know, did you just stay at home and put on an oil of cloves? You had to make those decisions. Mm, mm. You couldn't just ring and, up and go down the road. And also just loneliness. Right? I mean, loneliness, often your, yes. your man was away for a long time. Yes. Plantations were extremely large. I mean, yes. they would go wandering off for days there. Yes. And, it, you know, if they weren't part of a wider society, that was, how did they cope with just the intense loneliness? That was very, very difficult. I think loneliness and isolation were probably the worst problems. Uh, this is the difficulty of marrying a tea planter. And that is why so many tea planters actually um, had Indian girls who came from the nearby village uh, safe in the knowledge that they would be looked after and their children would be looked after. But that was the most difficult. In any uh, town centre, in any town, you were assured of a social circle. In a cantonment where there were regiments, you had all the your brother officer's wives, a lot of people to talk to. And up in the hills, of course, it was very social. Mm. Yes. I, we're also, uh, I mean, you know, despite often quite big privation and, and things like that, you also talk about what a, a lot of these women describe in the magnetic pull of India. I mean, both into, you know, I'm, I'm quite interested in, you know, what did they take away from their experiences of India? Did, I mean, did they fall in love with the country or did they just think this was somewhere where I went, I did get married, I had a life, I had children, but some came away with a much some deeper relationship. absolutely fell in love with India. I mean, there is something magical about India. It's always, certainly with English people, it's always had uh, this almost gravitational pull. And I mean, from Queen Victoria on, English people have been fascinated by India, and there's something about the art, the buildings, the people, the gracefulness, the brilliant colours. It's the intense colour is one of the things, or, you know, these bright pink, emerald green, sapphire blue saris, the silver bracelets on brown arms, the gracefulness of their posture, um, the general sort of magic of the place, the birds, Hoopos that look like sort of little Art Deco birds with these fans. Uh, do you have them here, Hoopos? I don't live here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, they have a I wide variety of uh, I know, flora and fauna. I know, but you know, that is partly what is... Uh, people were, a lot of people absolutely fell in love with India, and some stayed on. Yeah. And, you know, there were also quite a lot of Australian girls who came yeah, out. Yeah, I, I want to talk about these Australian girls. You know, what... Why are they part of the fishing fleet? I mean, well, what's wrong with Australian men? I mean, what's, Well, what's only you there? can answer what's wrong with Australian men. I, I personally haven't found anything wrong with them yet, but I look forward to learning in depth. Um, but they would come out, and I have to say, some of them introduced a welcome note of pragmatism. Uh, the advice from one of them, I remember, was always save up your very oldest underclothes for the journey, because then you don't have to wash them, you just push them out through the porthole. So I ask you to picture the Indian Ocean strewn with a trail of soiled mm. night dresses. Just bloomers all the way back to <laughs> Brisbane or something. Yeah, I like that. Bloomers back to Brisbane, yes. Um, but they came out and enjoyed it. Mostly they landed at Colombo, and they would meet very often the planters in Ceylon. They were very popular with them, I can tell you. Mm. And, and I mean, we're also, I mean, that, that talking about Colombo, I mean, you know, we're not just talking about, I mean, we're, we're talking about what we would under, what we understand as the Raj, yes. which now, of course, would include what is what is now Bangladesh, what is Burma, yes. Uh, yes. Sri Lanka, and so yes. on. Yes. Were, 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 things, were any, things any different there? Burma seems to have been a, a, a slightly different place in terms of what, what the men were doing. You know? Yes, Burma was rather different. 
I know a little less about Burma, but um, there, I think, intermarriage went on much more. It was somehow more, more remote. Uh, most people, as I say, went to India, and Sri Lanka was really where, I suppose, there were more planters than anything else. A, a tea and coffee they mm. had, and I think they had indigo also before the indigo trade collapsed. Yeah, teak. They had the teak as well, tea. didn't they? Yes, with, teak, with the yes, yes. yes. Yeah. Yes. I mean, I'm, I'm going to uh, throw this open to some questions in uh, five minutes or so, so have a think about what you want to ask, and there's, there's microphones to go to. I, I want to ask a very general question. I don't know if you can really answer this in a sense, but I'm just, you know, did the fishing fleet, it worked in the sense that women who didn't have husbands got husbands. Did it work in the sense of creating, were these good marriages? Did they, did they work on the whole? Can we generalise at all? Yes, we can generalise, and yes, they did work on the whole. I only heard of one case that was... Uh, really unhappy and a lot of cases I remember meeting um, one woman a fishing fleet girl in the 1930s she was 97 when I spoke to her she had met her husband she'd gone out as a girl of 19 she'd met her husband uh, uh, the first evening she'd gone out with her mother and he'd been invited to dinner the first evening she said I always remember him bounding up the stairs he had uh, uh, they spent the whole fortnight really together he'd take her sailing uh, to dances, this, that, and the other. And after the f end of a fortnight, her mother took her off to the hills. Then she went home. Then the Second World War started, and she became a WAF officer. And six years after the last time she had seen him, and she had seen him for only a fortnight, the telephone went when she was on leave, and it was him, Nigel, saying, Will you marry me? And she said, Yes. And they arranged to meet at an hotel in London, and I said to her, weren't you terrified that he would have changed or you would have changed or even perhaps that you wouldn't have recognised him? And she said, I suppose on the top I was terrified, but she said underneath I was absolutely certain. And they married, they had a long and happy life, her eyes filled with tears when she spoke of him. Mm. He became a general. And I thought it was a lovely story. Mm. And, and that, that does remind me, now it's after 10 o'clock, I think we're allowed to talk about <laughs> yes. it. You know, sex was a bit of an issue, wasn't it? Because these, gir these girls, you know, you have a lot in your book. I don't know if this is reflective of the author that they choose to concentrate on certain aspects of it. But I mean, these girls were really walking into the unknown sexually as well, Absolutely, weren't they? I mean, they had yes. no training whatsoever. <laughs> I'm glad so. 10 is the watershed <laughs> are in Australia. It's 9 p.m. at home. <laughs> um, so I can see you're more advanced. Um, but yes, they did. They were walking into the unknown. There's one girl who, um, I mean, some of them, they were totally ignorant. I must stress, they were very carefully brought up. They were chaperoned. And here is this young woman. She's getting married. She's staying with her sister and brother-in-law. And she thinks of her brother-in-law as like a brother. And he is. Uh, uh, and she's sitting there waiting for her wedding dress. And he knocks at her door and comes in. And I assume shuffles about a bit rather and says, listen, whatever, whatever Rafe does tonight, it's all right. <laughs> and... She said that was the only preparation I had for married life. Mm. And I mean, you know, from, from Somerset, Mom and so on, we know that, you know, once people did work out the mechanics of sex and once they'd been married for a while, they started to sort of want to have sex with other people and things. I mean, was there, was there you know, Mom certainly has this about Malaya and Singapore and so on. Was there also this, Very, was there a scene? Uh, not things? so much in India itself, because you always had a senior officer of some description, ICS or in your regiment, looking over your shoulder, and it was incredibly divisive of any community, mm. you see. But, but in the difference was in Simla, that was the place where things happened. Simla had a huge reputation, because there were a lot of grass widows Simla, up we there. should say, is where the, the entire government moved there for the summer, didn't yeah, it? Yeah, moved because there for the summer until 1911, yeah. the entire government. And while the men were slaving away in the plains, soldiers and people afterwards, um, the wives were up in Simla, and young officers might get three weeks leave and they would go up and there'd be huge flirtations and much more. One of the Viceroy's wives described it as a place but a place where every Jack has someone else's Jill. And it was pretty true. <laughs> They're poaching the fish from the fishing. Yes. I quite like the idea of that. Um, 
before we do some questions, I, I do want to ask you, because you mentioned it, you have so many stories, so many anecdotes, all, all woven in so, so wonderfully. It's a lovely way of writing biographies of places and, and, and things, to have all these different stories. I mean, how do you do it? It's a mix of diaries, letters, and, but also yes. you, do, you, you meet a lot of people. You talk to people. I meet people, you talk to people. I've met a lot of the descendants. I've got 30 different sections of 30 collections of memoirs, of letters, um, of diaries, and loads of photographs. And I've been all over England talking to people. A lot of the descendants, you know, if it was a recent uh, fishing fleet girl, for instance, a mother or an aunt, they have uh, perfect memories of what that person said. Um, others, it's been handed down. It's a very live memory. It's a very live contact, mm. the contact with India. And you have to assess what fits in different. I've divided my book into, I suppose you'd say, going out and what happens there and things like the climate. And mm. you, you really have to remember a lot. A lot of the filing is in here. I think it's very clever how you do it, because as you say, I mean, you, 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 you know, you, the, the, the chapters break down into how, the, how these women dealt with the climate, how mm. they dealt with suddenly mm. being in a relationship but being quite ignorant about it, what their relationship was to India, how they passed their time, Yes. Um, the voyage itself. Well, you don't want a book like that to be muddled. Yes, it's but never I mean, you know, but the trick is, you, you would think all of these things going on, so some, someone who's a good example of something early on then comes back later on, and you also start people's stories and then bring them back in later on, mm. so that we see what we're doing. I mean, just on a technical level, I mean, how do you juggle all of that and keep control of it all? Because <laughs> it seems quite effortless when you read it. Well, I'm very glad, it, I can tell you it wasn't effortless, but I'm very glad it seems so. I, I don't really know how... Um, you have to have a fairly coordinated mind, yes. actually. You have to be fairly, you have to be on top of your subject. And the one thing is you must not be diverted by things. You, it's very often you think of, see something and you think, oh, that's rather fascinating. And then you realize it is entirely irrelevant. And with a deep sigh, you have to scratch out that wonderfully promising avenue because yeah. it'll just lead the reader astray. You've got to be, you've got to be focused. You absolutely have to be focused. And I see the focus is quite interesting because the interesting thing about this is, you know, we should sort of um, uh, let people know that also, you know, I mean, this book has been optioned for a film. Right? Uh, yes, I'm now, very now, lucky. Film, like films that. are not always very good at weaving lots and lots of stories in, are they? They tend to want one well, story and how it works. How, think, how are you going to approach that? I think that? what um, I think I'm going to be the consultant on the film, which is nice. But I think what they're going to do is they will have three fictional fishing fleet girls who meet on the boat going out, which no doubt many of them did because they, mm. some of the passenger lifts are simply full of unmarried young women. So three girls meeting on the way out and becoming friends is entirely plausible, feasible. Sure. It, you know, it would have happened. And I think probably follow their stories. Um, it won't be anybody real, but they will do the things that quite a lot of people in my book did and that any fishing fleet girl would have done. And they will depict it against the background that I have drawn. That is how I think and things will happen. from any particular period? Because, of course, you draw well, across 300 I draw years or something. Well, I draw in 300 years. I think, my guess, is they will probably do it the early part of the 20th century. Yeah. That's my guess. Yeah. I mean, they've got to think of all sorts of extras, like clothes and goodness knows what. Yeah. I mean, this seems to be. I mean, the fishing fleet is not necessarily in everyone's. I mean, you've written about the Mitfords, for instance, and we were talking yesterday about you know how Mit, not Mitfords themselves necessarily, but tropes of the Mitfords pop up in 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 you know television things like Upstairs, Downstairs, Now, and things like that. There's a sort of uh, unity type Mitford ca yes. type character there. But the fishing fleet is that. I mean, I was thinking, you know. Oh, bloody Downton Abbey, you know, but I was, I was thinking, like, you know, th th there's, there's three girls. Now, after I read your book, I thought, well, you know, the one who has a bit of a problem finding a husband, why don't they pack her off to India? That, that family <laughs> must have had some connection to India. Yes, right? they should have, they should have. I mean, An know, oversight, I feel. Well, she's oversight. struggling around. It, mm. You know, it's after the First World War, so the odds are doubly yes. against yes, her. She's yes. pretty plain and all the rest of it. I was like, put her on a boat to India, for God's sake. Huh? You know? Yes. But yes. The, the fishing fleet hasn't, I think... Has, Hasn't well, they weren't part of, of the consciousness of no, everyone. No, no, in no, terms no. Of being they were. Eaten, they it? were not. I have to stress, they were not grand at all. They were probably. Um, yes, you see, a lot of their brothers were empire builders. That was how, uh, in Victorian mm. times, that's why there was quite a sort of diminishment of men that these girls couldn't marry. They were what you would probably call 
fairly well born but impoverished so that the brothers went to they didn't go to Eton and Winchester they would go to Haleybury or mm. that um, public school that uh, Kipling focuses on in Stalking Co, Westwood Ho public schools, yes, but at the fees that their parents could afford, yeah. who were not well Haley, off. Haleybury was an East India Company school, and it was, uh, that's yeah. right, it was closed down when Haleybury, when the East India Company stopped, and it was rebuilt mm. immediately afterwards, yeah. and went, just went on exactly the same, actually. And for the earlier days of this, would I be right in thinking that the sort of family that might have sent their girls out, I was thinking, you know, uh, like Pride and Prejudice, Mrs. Bennett, she stuck with yeah. all of these daughters, yeah. right, you know, wh why, sh why didn't she send that's a couple right. of them off to India? So. Yes, and I mean, Scottish merchants would, would um, go to India and trade in jute and yeah. you know it, it was that kind of thing uh, absolutely fascinating um, there must be some questions and I believe there's a microphone you have to sort of get up and wander over to the microphone and then uh, there's a gentleman sir you spoke of um, the British men who married into the uh, Indian population or had liaisons and I'm wondering if there are similar stories concerning British women who married Indians or had dalliances with Indians, and if so, what were the consequences? Well, I didn't come across any, and it would have been much, much rarer, because don't forget the girls who went out to India were closely supervised, um, chaperoned. Uh, the, I've got one story about a girl who found a dashing Indian prince very attractive, but was quickly, he was quickly warned off by her mother and she was whisked away. Uh, it, so men had much more independence of action. Uh, the government did not like a single, uh, um, unattended young woman, a woman of any age, arriving in India. She had to be the responsibility of some man. If you were returning from school, you were the responsibility of your father, who would come and meet you or send a servant to meet you. If you were going to stay with somebody, you were responsible for your responsibility of your sister's husband, if you were going to stay with your sister, and so on. And even uh, travellers like Rosita Forbes and Gertrude Bell um, had to have invitations to go and stay. They were handed on, as Gertrude Bell said rather bitterly, like parcels. But they were not independent. So it was much less likely. I didn't come across any. Thank you. They had, some of the princes had European mistresses who were kept, uh, probably ladies with a rather shady past, who were kept firmly out of sight. Now there's a book. <laughs> I'd like, if you could weave the stories of mistresses of Maharajas, that's, that's I, I think there's, uh, yeah. Sir? I thoroughly enjoy all of your books, and I can assure you they're very, very popular in our public library system here in South Australia as well. Um, could you share with us uh, what you're planning to do next? Yes, I will if you'd like. Um, that I'm s how nice of you to say those <laughs> kind things to me. What I'm doing next, in fact I've actually drafted the first few chapters, is a close focus look at uh, the years 1912, 13, 14 and 15, um, because it saw such a huge change in Britain. The previous year the power of the House of Lords had been broken, um, suffragettes were fighting for a vote, uh, there was a lot of industrial strife, the welfare state had just begun. Um, nobody sort of really tumbled to the fact that there was war on the horizon. If you had said the word war in June 1914, everybody would have thought you were talking about war between the North and South of Ireland. The Irish question reigned supreme. And when war did start, um, there was a lot of jubilation almost. There was join up quickly or you'll miss the fun. And young men would go around in taxis singing God Save the King and the Marseillaise. It was an occasion for almost for celebration, which It'll was be extraordinary. Over by Christmas. Yeah, exactly. That's what people thought. The, one of the few people who didn't think that was Kitchener. But anyway, by 1915, with the shell crisis and everything, and the central thread, which I hope is going to hold it all together, is the story of the Asquiths, which is drama packed. Margot Asquith and her husband, who the Prime Minister, H. H. Asquith, who took us into war, he, in 1912, he falls in love with his daughter's best friend. And we have this huge drama. Margot then discovers it. He writes her letters in cabinet. Um, the emotions swirling around Downing Street are intense. It's an absolute cockpit of the emotions. And finally, in 1915, when she 
announces her engagement to somebody else and uh, there is this shell munitions crisis and Lloyd George is emerging. Asquith listlessly agrees to a coalition and I'm sort of concluding there but while I'm at it, if anybody has any letters or diaries of that period, yeah. <laughs> I'd love to see them. If you are <laughs> very interested in 1913 and if you are getting to Canberra uh, while you're here, on day. Wednesday night, the National Museum is opening Glorious Days, oh. Australia in 1913, oh. to show the optimism and the happiness before the Great War. How interesting. Uh, course, I wish I was going to. Australians are very lucky as well this week, because I noticed from watching the television last night, that uh, that BBC adaptation of Parade's End is, yes. about, is about to start yes. here, which I thought was fantastic. I yes. know that the critics were slightly divided on it, and that's absolutely that moment in that time. Is that moment. Mm, Ford, Ford well, is that moment. Maddox Ford, Maddox Ford, yes. So you can watch that because it is literary and all the rest of it. It's not junk TV, it's very good. It's literary. Yeah, mm. even though Sherlock Holmes is like uh, the Christopher Teachers guy. But anyway, uh, Madam. Um, this follows on slightly uh, something you said earlier. But um, in, you said that in the early days it were the lower orders who went out and I was wondering if there were a lot of cross-class um, marriages. Well, and did the, the, um, the sort of girls that came out later, were they of a higher class than the lower, earlier ones? I don't think I said the lower orders came out. What happened, they were divided into gentlewomen and others on those early boats. So that's what happened. Well, the girls who came out later you see, by 1840, the East India Company were charging girls to go out. So it was not so much a class barrier as a money barrier. You probably couldn't afford it if you were working class. So it did raise the bar slightly. Thank you. Um, what, what, what did the, you know, Kipling's great everyday soldiers, you know, what, what did they do? For women, I mean, because you know, why weren't they shipping out well, scullery girls to sort of? Keep their well, they happy? didn't. They would probably m marry at home, and after a certain length of service, you could come out with your wife. And what, so there were quite a lot of wives. Yeah. Um, but, but the they others had access to well, rampant prostitution they went, as well. Yes, they went to brothels. Yeah, yeah. They went to brothels yeah. because the army took the very sensible view that even though they were forbidden, soldiers would take no notice of the ban and still go. So they, for a long time, these brothels were. Uh, medically supervised and the mm. girls had medical examinations etc then when the sort of purity movement swept England in the 1890s I suppose around then and all the missionaries and people came out and said do away with brothels they can't have it the army was very against that happening because they said they'll only go to unlicensed places and catch disease and the year after these brothels the licensed ones were shut down the yeah. incidence the of syphilis. venereal disease <laughs> doubled Okay. Sir. And I'd be intrigued to know your impressions of how the women found England and the return to life after the end of the Raj in 1948. Well, I didn't follow that too much because uh, really it was the single girls, the fishing fleet I was focusing on, but an awful lot of them found it a tremendous shock coming back to England. You know, the weather, the cold, they'd always been used to find whether they'd been used to, if they dropped a handkerchief on the floor, it was picked up and taken away. And, of course, the expense of England after India, they lived at a much lower standard when they came back. And, for instance, they'd have to learn how to cook. They'd have they, all sorts of things which they had never done. So for many, although they often carried a dream of home in their mind, it was disillusionment when they came back. And I believe a number of people actually went back and tried to live in India after that. Mm. Uh, do, we, do we know what the attrition rate was as well? How many of these girls sort of went out there, found a husband because that, that was what you did, and then just after a while just said, I really can't take this and ran away? Or did social convention mean that they just couldn't do that? Yeah. Well, on the whole, they didn't run away. Social convention meant that they didn't. Mm. Um, some of them sort of persuaded their husbands to resign from the army or, you know, a few did. But most would have been inhibited by the thought they were ruining a man's career, which would have happened. Yeah. And... Most of them sort of, they did realise what they were going in, they were going into. I think I, possibly my most uh, overriding impression of all of them, after knowing what they stuck and seeing how they coped with it, these young, inexperienced women, I kind of understood the spirit that had got London through the Blitz, if you know what I mean. They yeah. carry on. They regardless. just got on with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. 
We have time for some more questions if, any, if anyone's got one. Uh, make way. Oh, well done. Yes, madam. Thanks very much, Anne. I was just going to say, um, you, you, there was a question asked about the Australian women who went, and of course, you know, there were quite a lot of connections between Australia and India, particularly in the 19th and early 20th century, with um, you know British officers coming to Australia for leave, um, and the family sort of linking across sort of Britain, Australia, and India. So. Um, some of those people who Australian women who went out went to stay with relatives and friends, just as the as the British women did, I think. Yes. But um, you you mentioned missionaries only at the end there, but of course um, there were also quite you know there must have been marriages between missionaries. But I had a question now, and it's totally gone. Oh yes, at the end, yes, I've read your book, and at the end I noticed that some of the women were actually coming out to jobs you know, as a sort of secretary to the governor's wife and so forth. So how much, you know, was that happening, the sense of a more independent woman who was going out there for a job towards the end of your period? <coughs> well, not often. I mean, that was a very social kind of job. If you were social secretary to a resident or to a, a governor, um, you probably knew him, you probably, uh, your mother might be a friend of the governor's wife, and Everybody, the viceroy, the viceroy, she always needed a sort of a sort of ladies in waiting. She always needed people to be, and these would might might be friends of her her daughters uh, or family friends. You see, it was it wasn't a job job in a way. You didn't apply for it. And, job, yeah, it yeah, so? exactly. It wouldn't be. You'd have to n know the person. It wouldn't be something that was advertised and you applied for like a lot of jobs. And it's perfectly true that there were a few doctors, and certainly there were missionaries. But when I said you, you were the responsibility of some man, if you were a doctor, female doctor going out, you were the responsibility of the head of the hospital. If you were a missionary, you were the responsibility of the church. Um, they weren't too much, the fishing fleet. Very often they had already started on their life's course and out they would go. But some actually did become nurses because they thought they would meet quite a lot of chaps in India. But is there a history of women becoming more independent and doing interesting things? I mean, we do know that you know women travel writers like Isabella Bird and people were around in sort of China and places like that. I mean, there were women who were who, who ended up by dint of something. Maybe they maybe they were widowed very early and had a, had the pension, so they went on and actually sort of you know got involved in things, businesses. Women things. got involved in things. Yes, I think in businesses more, but. Um, there isn't a single case that I was able to find uh, that they were involved in the government of India. It was an all-male hierarchy. They just get involved in things like the antique trade and the curios trade and ship, shipping Yes, they would do, things. they might do that sort of thing, but not as single young women. No, not as the fishing fleet. Um, if they had married somebody and been left as a widow and were already established in India and already had established position, you see, that might ha uh, happen, yes. But a young fishing fleet girl could not go out there and say, I'm going to start a jewellery business. Uh, what, what, I mean, when, when you wrote this book, what, you know, obviously you'd known about the fishing fleet that had been buzzing around for you. I mean, what, what's, what's really struck with you as the sort of, you know, what you weren't really expecting when you did that? What, what did you find out about these women that sort of surprised you? I think what surprised me when taking everything into consideration was just how far a woman go, how far, and what she will put up with in the quest for a mate. Really? Really yeah. surprised me. <laughs> what, so, so that's sort of, you know, the, the, quality, the poor quality of the men is what actually <laughs> surprised you, <laughs> no, isn't it? No, right. no, mm -hmm. no, but all the trials, earthquakes, floods, finding plague. I mean, one girl was married to somebody and, you know, plague bro broke out in the village and her husband tried to, her, to make her go, you see. It was plague dead rats in the stables and she said I'm not leaving the house until a dead rat falls from the rafters and luckily it didn't and she didn't get plagued but you know the, all those things yeah amazing What's put out? amazing, amazing. <coughs> now I do have to say that uh, the bookshop over there is absolutely stuffed full of decorsi <laughs> um, we need to clear it out make room for some of the other writers um, but but of course the fishing <laughs> fleet is there but Anne's other great books wonderful biography of Diana Mosley um, I like that very much. I thought Debs at War was just a wonderful read about these these uh, posh girls suddenly stuck in factories with sort mm. of, you know, working class girls and stuff and, and learning the facts of life that way, which didn't really work. 
Um, Snowden is a great book, 1939, the last season. We're obviously going to look forward to the film. We're going to look forward to your next book and everything. So lots of books that you can buy. Anne will, of course, sign. You'll sign anything except a check, like <laughs> most writers. But, um, but, but thank you so much. That was absolutely fascinating. Please, and, and the course. Thank you.